These videos are a series of films created by researchers at the University of British Columbia. For audio-only listeners, they star a number of plush animals acting out simple stories of good guys and bad guys. In one video, Cow is trying to open a box, but can't. Then Pig comes, and they open the box together. Yay! In another, when Pig comes, they sit on the box so Cow can't open it. And Cow gets sad. Aww. Infants and toddlers were shown a number of these films and their attitudes towards each character were measured. Researchers found that kids, even the youngest, nonverbal ones, preferred the good guys over the bad guys. While kids are still really selfish when it comes to their own things, they seem to develop a keen eye for right and wrong, and an empathy for others pretty early on. Empathy, it turns out, comes built in. It's one of those virtues like justice and freedom that gets brought up a lot in politics, but it seems people are becoming more selective of who they give their empathy to. We saw this as headlines of a missing submersible washed over the news. The premise was alluring. Five rich dudes visiting the wreck of the Titanic lost in a submersible in the deep sea, with a quickly dwindling oxygen supply stuck in a tiny metal prison, the five men on board quickly gathered a lot of sympathy from the media and public at large. Turns out, the mystery angle was a bit of a dead end. The sub imploded mere hours into its journey. But still, during those few days, it seems everyone was wondering how they would feel if they were in that situation. On board was none other than British businessman Hamish Harding, as well as a Pakistani businessman and his 19-year-old son, who allegedly didn't want to go on the trip but went at his dad's request. It was an undeniable tragedy. But not everyone felt that way. The internet was flooded with memes and jokes at the expense of the people on board. People quickly pointed out that the tickets were 250k a pop. Harding was a billionaire. The vast majority of us would never find ourselves in such a horrifying situation. Instead of a tragedy, it seemed more like a dark comedy, a story of rich people having way too much money and time on their hands and doing something reckless. Or to quote Reddit's favorite phrase, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. This was combined with a genuine distaste for billionaires. As Washington Post's Molly Roberts put it, the belief is that not only is every billionaire a policy failure, but also being a billionaire is a personal failure because of the immorality and the lack of empathy inherent in hoarding that much money while the huddled masses starve and the globe gets hotter. In this context, the deaths of these ridiculously wealthy individuals looks like an excellent opportunity for a truly disgusting meme. What we are missing is that responding to a perceived lack of humanity with dehumanization will only, pardon the sick sick pun, sink us all. To the mainstream press and many onlookers, the internet's cruel reaction and dehumanization of the people on board seemed like a wider part of an empathetic decline, a sign of the world's regression into polarization. Are we facing an empathy deficit? Compassion fatigue is usually understood under the lens of its effect on caregivers like doctors and therapists. It's a form of secondhand trauma that comes with working with people who have experienced firsthand trauma. But it really does seem like everyone is experiencing some form of low-grade compassion fatigue. Between 1970 and 2009, self-reported levels of empathy among young people was way, way down. Researchers have tied this phenomenon back to our precarious economy and our culture of overwork, overstress, and burnout. As socialist John Lone puts it, poverty, at its core, is a traumatic experience where it is through the instability it creates surrounding food and rent affordability, the lack of equitable opportunity for quality education, the lack of access to systems of mental and physical health care, or the criminalization of poverty through court fees, policing, and prison systems. Trauma affects people in poverty in multiple and layered ways. Behind every crisis brought on through capitalism's virulent hunger for profit lurks a trauma that impacts nearly every community. So there's definitely something to the claims made about the internet's attitude towards the whole thing. Empathy really is in short supply. And yet, despite the submersible being the latest cover story of our societal empathy deficit, when you think about it, the people on board received an overwhelming amount of support. In public money alone, it's clear society did care. 
no doubt fueled by the 24-7 news cycle. Meanwhile, by now you've probably heard of the Greece boat disaster, where an overcrowded boat of migrants sank leading to the deaths and disappearances of many, many more people. This event did not generate very much empathy from the Western public. I don't even know any of the names of the victims. The Wikipedia page doesn't list the victims like it does for the Titan incident. It aggregates the lives lost into one number. And why would this event capture our attention? It wasn't unique. The misfortune of the masses of third worlders is a background hum that most of us have tuned out. They don't get the privilege of being named. In his book Against Empathy, Paul Bloom brings up a similar example to the sub and the boat. A tragic event befell an elementary school in 2012 that captured national headlines. 28 children and adults passed away, and the public empathized deeply, sending countless donations to the suffering town. But the town was inundated with so much charity that it added to their burden. Hundreds of volunteers had to be recruited to store the gifts and toys that got sent to the city, which kept arriving despite pleas from officials for people to stop. A vast warehouse was crammed with plush toys that the townspeople had no use for. Millions of dollars rolled in to this already relatively affluent community. There was a dark comedy here, with people from far poorer communities sending their money to much richer people, guided by the persistent itch of empathetic concern. Paul notes that that same year, more schoolchildren had passed away due to gun violence in Chicago alone with not so much as a mention by the media, which just goes to show that our empathy, like everything else in society, can be captured by elite interest. It tends to flow upward to familiar white and wealthy faces, and it can lead to unproductive outcomes. So I think we should be a little critical of what we allow to capture our hearts and minds. So does that mean I think we should find joy when bad things happen to rich people? Not quite. Schadenfreude, or finding pleasure in someone else's misery, definitely seems to have become more common in recent years, and I struggled with this question quite a bit, as it seems you all did too, at least according to this poll. But there's something mainstream commentators like Molly Roberts are missing. Just like researchers have found empathy develops incredibly early in children, so too do they find early signs of schadenfreude. In this 2014 study, researchers put pairs of children in unequal situations, having one child, let's call them child A, in the arms of the mother, while the other child, child B, stands aside to watch. It's an unequal situation. On cue, the parent spills water on themselves and needs to put child A down to clean up. It's a random case of misfortune. Then, the positive expression of child B was measured. And even in toddlers, as young as 24 months, they display signs of schadenfreude, showing excitement at the misfortune of child A and the adult. And the kids didn't hide it either. Some of them jumped up and down and clapped while shouting, good. And sure, we can write a critical essay about how awful it is that this child is dehumanizing someone from such an early age. And if they were my kid, they'd definitely get a talking to. But that would miss the point of the study. As the researchers conclude, schadenfreude likely has a strong genetic connection to our natural aversion to inequity. Humans don't like inequality and unfairness, and we're actually really, really good at sniffing it out. While empathy is one emotion that guides us towards fairness, schadenfreude is the other side of the coin. It's the bad cop that keeps potential offenders in line and it likely played an important role, for example, in early egalitarian human societies as a way of keeping each member of the tribe accountable to each other. Both schadenfreude and empathy play a role in how we regulate inequity and society at large. That's not to say schadenfreude is totally fine though. Other research has noted subtypes of schadenfreude more closely associated with dark traits like narcissism, sadism, and psychopathy. But putting those aside, considering we're currently living in the Second Gilded Age, schadenfreude seems almost like a predetermined way a lot of people will react. A random misfortune can feel like justice in a world that's unjust, like the water cup falling on the parent or a submersible imploding and decimating the five rich people inside. But just like the child jumping up and down in glee, it's worth asking if this is the most productive thing we should be doing. 
I think it's safe to say people deserve some basic level of kindness and respect. And yet, I can't bring myself to scold people for doing the Twitter equivalent of the kid jumping up and down in Schadenfreude, because the few exclamations into the online void of the powerless are meaningless. What seems more meaningful is how our attention and empathy are directed. Quickly dwindling due to the stress of capitalism, I think we all ought to be more mindful of who and what captures our empathy. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments down below.